So good morning. My name is Matt Robinson. I'm from Horseshoe Bend National Military Park. Welcome this morning. So this is our annual symposium, and we want to thank Pebble Hill and Auburn University. They are always uh, wonderful partners for hosting us here. Um, we are very grateful for this space and this partnership. Um, so today we're we're a little shifting from what you're seeing on your schedules. We're only going to have two presenters today. Unfortunately, one of them, uh, one of our presenters was sick and not able to make it. Um, but luckily, we have two wonderful presentations that could probably go for three hours apiece, and we would all love it. Um, but we'll just extend those presentations a little bit. Um, so up first, starting with, we're going to have uh, Dr. Catherine Braun um, from a whole field professor of Southern history here at Auburn University, uh, author of Deerskin and Duffels, and former president of a few places, just a couple. So they're friends of Horseshoe Bend. Um, the Alabama Historical Association and the Bartram Trail Conference. So without further ado, Dr. Catherine Brown. Oh, what a relief. My reading glasses are up here. I was about to be in big trouble. Uh, okay, here we go. Um, thank you all for coming today. It's really great to see so many familiar faces and some of my former students and, and friends from all over the state. So uh, I hope you enjoy the day. I know if you get a chance, you want to go see Pebble Hill. Um, my task today is a rather unusual one. It's to provide an overview of Creek treaties through the end of the Creek War, which means I'm going to be very broad and very general. I'm just putting the toe in the stream here. Uh, and I'd like to begin by pointing out the definition of a treaty in its simplest form, which just means an agreement between sovereign powers. And that's important. Um, it, it also implies negotiation, give and take. Uh, and the reason I start by pointing that out is the other day I was emailing back and forth uh, with a colleague, and he, he sent a line in an email. And he said, of course, all the treaties were coerced from the Native people. And I said, no, not really. Uh, I think by thinking of treaties that way, it takes away agency from Native diplomats, particularly the Creek diplomats that I know very well through the 18th century, who spoke in the beginning from positions of power, authority, who, who told, you know, they stood firm on certain issues. And of course, as time passed, things changed and, and power shifts. But I think we, we just need to start out by trying to look at both sides of the story and, and restoring um, what historians call agency to the Native people that we're talking about. Well, my focus this morning, besides every treaty ever signed by the Creek Indians, um, is uh, on the Creek Indians and their biggest allies and occasionally adversaries, and that would be the British colonists and later the Americans. And now Creeks made treaties uh, with the French and Spanish colonies too, but by far the Anglo treaty system was the most important uh, and the most uh, complicated by um, uh, any standard. So what I'm going to do today is just take on three very general themes that we can trace through all these treaties that basically, and I'm going from the 17th to the early 19th century, so y'all hang on to your seats. Um, so the three themes, one, well, what were the major issues in these treaty negotiations? Um, two, what was the mechan uh, you know, the mechanics of it? How did they do it? How did they, where did they meet? What did they do? Um, and uh, the meetings or congresses, as they were called in the 18th century, were big affairs with hundreds of people. Uh, and by Congress, I mean that in the formal meeting of delegates to decide a certain question. And the third theme is, uh, and I think this is a very important one, through these negotiations with outsiders, you have the development of a very important formal institution among the Creeks to deal with outsiders on matters of national importance. And we're all very familiar with that as the National Council, which didn't exist early on. So by treaty making with outsiders, Creeks begin to define themselves as a nation and build institutions to protect their nation and their borders, which they are negotiating. So I think that's a very important important uh, aspect of this too. So um, first of all, the issues, and there are basically three through all the, the you know, through all the years, uh, three. Uh, one is these are treaties of alliance, military and economic. 
trade agreements primarily. But they all have economic comments. You trade and you have commerce with friends and allies. Uh, so that's one big issue. The second and a very important and contentious one is land and boundaries, seeding land, defining boundaries and so forth. And a third, which I'm gonna to touch on here today and some, you might wanna follow up on the Q&A about this, but it's equally important. And that was how satisfaction was rendered. And in the 18th century, when they said satisfaction, they, may, they meant what happens when one of your citizens commits a crime against another citizen? Um, who, uh, how do you deal with criminal or unacceptable, unacceptable behavior? Who gets punished? How are they punished under whose laws? And it points to a very different system of rendering justice between the Creek people and the English. Um, uh, the English concept, of course, is individual guilt. And, you, you know, if you commit a murder, you're tried in a court of law, you're punished, not your aunt, not your mother, that individual. Uh, in the Creek Nation, it's very different. It is the clan that bears responsibility. And this is always a contentious is issue in the 18th century, and it really becomes the 19th century's bugaboo uh, as far as uh, uh, Americans begin to think, well, if any Creek commits a, a atrocity on the border or home invasion has happened right before the Creek War, then it's a responsibility of the nation. And in fact, it's an act of war against the Americans. So this is a big thing, um, uh, this idea of justice and rendering satisfaction. So let's go back and get started. Now, the first Anglo Treaty of Importance uh, happened around 1685 with the Carolinians, a little no-count colony that was just getting started. They needed a cash crop. And uh, in this map of North America, uh, you see uh, uh, the major players of the day. And it looks like the British, the Spanish, and the French are big time players. Well, that's territory they claim. That's not territory they settle. And at this point, the Creeks have a higher population than the Carolinians, as do the Cherokees and all the other native peoples uh, around the way. But these European powers make massive land claims and they fight a series of wars throughout the 18th century over control of North America. Now, the Spanish arrived in the Creeks backyard first and they set up a mission system that demanded conversion to Catholicism and participation in town life dominated by Spanish dictates. Um, this so-called Spanish mis mission system was extensive and you see roads and little villages all the way from St. Augustine to the Apalachicola River here. And the Creeks, frankly, did not like what they saw. They did some trade with the Spanish, but they didn't like this conversion. They didn't like the way that there was some forced labor and so forth. And so here come the Carolinians at the end of the 17th century offering a real alternative to what the Spanish had. And that was access to guns and manufactured goods without the demand for vast cultural change. And so that first treaty, loose as it was, uh, was fine. The Creeks were all in. They became military and economic allies of the Carolinians who are very far away from them. There's no land involved in this one, uh, but the, the trade becomes very important. And the deer skins that the Creeks produce becomes Carolina's first cash crop before rice, before plantation economy could take place. And fighting with the Carolinians against the Spanish brought the Creek people, men, martial glory. It brought conquest of new territory for the Creek nation and wealth, incredible wealth in the form of trade goods to the Creek people. Now, this is a, a, um, a, an image from, uh, I think this is the old Mulgee uh, National Park had this once. Uh, in 1704, Carolinian James Moore uh, is credited with the destruction of the Spanish mission system. But the 1,000 or so Creek warriors who joined the expedition did the extra work. They enslaved the Appalachian Indians that they could capture, and those they didn't kill, uh, and exported them to took them to Charleston and exported them to the West Indies as enslaved people. Some of these Appalachians found refuge among the Creek towns, some as free people, some were enslaved. Others sought refuge in French territory to the West. 
And in the following years, the Carolinian and Indian slave raiders virtually wiped out the Indian population of Florida. And that's Creeks going down and doing that and really uh, buckled the Spanish mission system in what we call East Florida. And the result was that by 1763, a year I'll come back to in just a minute, the Lower Creek towns along the Chattahoochee, Flint Rivers of what's modern Georgia claim most of Florida by right of conquest, and they actually began to colonize the peninsula, building creek towns down as far as Tampa Bay. So this is an important part of Creek history, this military and economic alliance with the Carolinians that helps them in their rise to power. And we'll see other native uh, groups like the Cherokee dwindle in population over the 18th century. The Creeks increase uh, in military, political, and economic power. So that first major Anglo-Creek treaty set the stage for the rise of Creek power in the 18th century as British allies due to what the British superintendent of Indian affairs called the original great tie, the deerskin trade, which transformed the Creeks into commercial hunters and made them participants in a world exchange economy as allies of the British. Uh, and a it's only a few decades later then that the colony of Georgia comes into the picture, and it's in 1773 that things begin to change a little. And that deerskin trade was very important because it was an economic and military alliance as well as a personal alliance, bringing in a lot of cross-cultural contact as deerskin traders, traders make their um, homes in creek towns and marry with creek women and, and subtly change the creek world. But the creeks are very much in control at this point of what their situation is. It begins to change slightly uh, with the settlement of Georgia, and I'm being very broad in, <laughs> in everything here. Uh, so it was in 1763 that the Yamacraw Indians, a, who were really a mixture of Lower Creeks and Yamases, uh, had, who had just managed to settle that area a few years earlier, they hadn't been there long, they are the ones who greeted the Georgia colonists when they first arrived. And there are really no other tribes anywhere around because they had all been destroyed by either disease or warfare, enslavement, and that sort of thing. So the Yamacra, i.e. the Lower Creeks, are really in charge of what is Georgia. And so it is with Georgia in 1733, and then it's a little later, that a, a really um, interesting treaty is signed with Oglethorpe, and Savannah was built on what is called Yamacra. Uh, bluff. And according to Creek accounts later, and this is obviously every Creek thing I'm quoting here has been translated from Muskogee to Creek, um, they said at a later treaty proceedings, we gave the Georgians as much land as might build them a town to live upon. And there you see the town cleared, the squares laid out for military defense because the Spanish are still a threat. And the Georgians, is Georgia's a military colony, they need Creek fighters to help them too. So again, it's a political, military, and economic alliance with Georgia. Now, this is a very tangled treaty for a variety of reasons, um, uh, but not only did the Georgians need the Creeks for economic purposes, they needed them, uh, I mean, for defensive purposes, they needed them for economic purposes. And one of the main things that Oglethorpe wanted to do was divert the deerskins going to South Carolina to Charleston down to Savannah, because that's a valuable commodity. So it is an economic, politari, uh, political, and military uh, economics. And for our purposes, just note that it's the Lower Creeks who call the shots for land to the east toward the Atlantic from the Creek towns, the Lower Creek Indians on the Chattahoochee and Flint Rivers and so forth. Now, I'm fixing to flip a, uh, a slide that has all these treaty terms, and I've got the ones highlighted in blue that are important because the exact term, the exact provisions are what's important. What's important are the general trends here. Uh, it's a trade treaty. Uh, Georgians are going to, uh, if, if an English person commits a crime against the Creeks, the Georgians will pay restitution and punish their people according to English law. In other words, uh, they don't want the Creeks putting anybody to death. They'll do it themselves. This is very, very hard to do and enforce. Uh, it's, it's, it's a problem throughout the 18th and into the 19th century. Um, 
Notice that Casita and Coweta, the two largest Lower Creek towns, speak for all Lower Creek towns in any session of land. Uh, Creeks who commit crimes against Georgia to be tried according to English law never happens, okay? That's just not, it's a problem. And then uh, Creeks promise to return runaway slaves from the colony, uh, and that uh, is... Uh, you know, there's no slavery in Georgia at that particular time, but then promise of no correspondence with the Spanish or French. Again, uh, they're going to have plenty of correspondence with the Spanish, uh, particularly raiding the Spanish sites, uh, but uh, obviously they're going to have relationships with the French. So those are the treaties that the issues that will be in treaties for decades to come. And what followed were more treaties and agreements and arguments focusing on these same uh, issues. And rarely about land. And that is until 1763. And by that time, as I've just said, the Creeks had expanded their territorial claims and the Georgians were still boxed in to a re relatively confined area along the tidewater. Uh, and their population was small and it wasn't a big issue up until 1763. And Creeks had simply refused to part with property and the Georgians were too weak to insist. Uh, and besides, they needed to keep peace with the Spanish on their borders. And the other issue, of course, is some of the colonists ignored the established borders or the agreed upon borders and settled on Indian land anyway, which is another matter of contention. And I guess I better slip in a bit, a little bit about the French because the upper creeks, in fact, all creek towns ignored that part about correspondence with the French and Spanish, because as we all know, particularly around our part of the world, the upper creek towns allowed the establishment of Fort Toulouse about the same time, a French fort in the heart of the upper creek uh, uh, nation, and they did conduct some trade, limited trade with the Spanish. So what the creeks are doing is hedging their bets, and they kept, kept the British on their best behavior by always keeping, uh, you know, in the back of English minds, you're not nice to us, we'll go and be friends with the French and Spanish. And the historians have called this traditionally the playoff system. Uh, and it worked because the English were very nervous. The Creek military power, power did have the capability to wipe out these colonies. So they had to, you know, had to come to some negotiated agreements on uh, problems. All right, let's let's jump ahead. How about 30 years? And let's get to 1763, the end of the French and Indian War. Um, that really is a watershed year. And there, there are no Spanish in Florida after this. The, French, the Spanish lose their holdings. There are no French in Florida or Louisiana. And the English uh, need for allies against these colonial powers disappears overnight taking away a lot of uh, power from the creek point or the creek side of the negotiating table. Not only that, the colonies after the Seven Years' War are about to experience a surge in population that is going to put all the old boundaries in serious trouble. In fact, the great demographic shift is about to occur. And not only that, the British are taking control of the old Spanish colonies in East Florida and West Florida when the Spanish leave. Okay, so now is a good time to say something about Indian views on land ownership. As to the Floridas, the Creeks told the British when they came to St. Augustine and particularly when they came to Pensacola, which was Creek territory, the Creeks declared they had merely lent the land to the Spanish so they could grow crops and live there to trade. That We didn't give them that. And now the British were taking it over without getting proper permission from the Creeks. And the murder of the Ukshai, one of the most influential of the Upper Creeks, summed it up well in a, in a negotiation or a meeting with the British. And he said, it makes our hearts cross to see our lands taken without our liberty. He knows the white people's physic is strong for war. He thinks their head warriors have strong physic likewise. He thinks the white people intend to stop all their breaths by settling all around them. And to point out that, that he really meant business, he said, we know that you're hostile because your flags are crossed with red. 
she can't deny that Union Jack <laughs> looks pretty much like that. So those are fighting words spoken from a position of power at that time because the, Creek, uh, the British needed peace to get West Florida going. They needed peace to get East Florida going. And they don't have the military capacity. They're deeply in debt after the Seven Years' War. And so at this point, the British government has to take a breath and deal with the Creeks. Not necessarily, they didn't think of them as equals, but they understood that this was a problem that had to be dealt with in a respectful kind of way un unless war was going to break out. So uh, enter this thing at the bottom, uh, the Indian boundary or proclamation line of 1763, which was uh, supposed to be a negotiated boundary between British colonial settlements and Indian lands that theoretically ran along the Appalachian Ridge. And this is an old map uh, done by one of the South's leading uh, cartographers, Lou Divorcey. And this is theoretically where the, uh, the line would have gone on a map if they'd have had decent maps uh, of the area. So the idea was that um, the, they would make treaties with all the Indian tribes all up and down all the colonies and establish a mutually agreed upon boundary line. And it would be the imperial government who would be responsible for keeping the colonists and their cattle off Indian lands to prevent incidents, a war, and that sort of thing. Now, the British saw this as a temporary fix uh, to halt or prevent further conflict. Uh, long term, of course, the plan was to acquire additional sessions. And what they really wanted was to allow for orderly, peaceful settlement of decent people who would actually buy land and pay for it and that sort of thing. They didn't want ruffians all along the frontier causing problems. So, you know, in the in the halls of Whitehall, when they're making uh, policy, this seemed like a, a, a good idea. I'm going to say the American colonists, I am going to go over probably, the American colonists uh, really hated this. And this is uh, always held up as one of the reasons for the American Revolution, this notion that the British are keeping them from this uh, economic boon, which is uh, settling in Western lands. So the British, temp you know, a temporary line, orderly settlement, the Creeks had a different idea. Uh, and you, here you have a quote from an upper creek and a lower creek. And I love it because they use the imagery that would be very familiar to colonists. This boundary will be like a stone wall, never to be broke, right? A stone wall that will last to the ages. This in the 1760s is the formation of an idea of a permanent national border for the Creek Nation. And what happens is that you have a series of post-war Congresses to determine this boundary. Uh, 1763, the Congress of Augusta, which was with all the Southeastern tribes, basically established peace. And the British said, we're gonna be your friends. We're gonna trade. We're gonna establish these boundaries. And then at Pensacola, they worked for a boundary for West Florida and Piccolotta in East Florida. That was the one there. And Pensacola, they tried to get an extension. That didn't go so well because that's when you get the quote from that chief on the top. And that's the sea quote. The line was supposed to be like a stone wall, never to be broke. And so, and we will give you land later, but only out of the generosity for our friends. So this is an important concept, this boundary. So it brings us to another important point, and that is who has the right to alienate Creek land? Who actually owned Creek land? Who could lend it, sell it, give it away? Uh, and theoretically, <clears throat> all Creek lands were owned equally by all members of the Confederacy. That's what that chief said in uh, 1771, Mr. Sequo, as their natural inheritance. He said, Mr. Sequo said, every child in the nation has an equal property in the land with the first warrior. Now, by natural inheritance or equal property, he meant the right to use the land. Neither warriors nor children were empowered to alienate that share of land. It was owned jointly. Land was controlled or owned by the various tribes or towns of the Confederacy. And each tribe held title to specific regions. Remember, it's the lower creeks who are negotiating with lands to the east. 
And it was the headman in each town who allocated land to various clans in his town based on need for agricultural purposes. And this is a very um, central area where the town proper is. And then clan elders further divided land among the natural lineages. How do we know that? The Creeks say that when they're negotiating with the British. But the hunting reserves, this big land all over the southeast, was open to pretty much everybody. Although, basically, some towns tended to go here and this town tended to go there. And those actual locations are, are not as well known, but we know enough to know that was the case. That certain, you know, certain towns of the Creek Confederacy hunted here and certain went there. Again, because they tell us so. Um, but... Basing their actions on this ancient prerogative to apportion crop land among the matrilineages of towns, headmen of towns conducted negotiations with European powers regarding the transfer of creek lands. And as in other matters, their decisions were founded on consensus and they required widespread popular support if they were going to carry weight. They had no enforcement mechanism. Um, so basically, you got general widespread agreement about what we can give, as they, as they would have said, and then that's what they, they sent speakers to do. Uh, and that's basically what my slide says, so I could have skipped saying all that. Um, so who negotiates? It's the leading headmen from the most powerful towns or their best orators, one the guy who's speaking at the Congress of Piccolata, he told the British, my name means tongue of flame. He was a powerful orator. He could talk. Um, and so they're chosen to speak on behalf of various components of the Confederacy. And they always say who they are, whether they're Tallapoosas. I speak for the eight towns of the Tallapoosas. I speak for the Abikas. I represent the Alabamas. I am from the I am the head warrior of the Lower Creek town of Coweta. They always introduce themselves and give their authority to do that. And so it's from these cohorts of regional uh, delegations of headmen that a new formalized institution, the National Council, will develop in the late 18th into the 19th, particularly in the early 19th century, to deal with matters of national importance associated with foreign powers. Now, all these Anglo Creek negotiations followed Western diplomatic conventions in which the speeches of the speakers were translated into English and written down. And I love this little powder horn. This was uh, the, the, the British officers who, who attended this had a tradition of doing powder horns. There are some wonderful ones. And this one has a tangled history, but ended up in the Royal Ontario Museum. There are actually three of these powder horns, and they all have basically the same things. But here the Creeks have built an arbor, and here are the British, here's the guy transcribing things, and they say, you know, they say who they are, what their names are, they, um, uh, on it goes. And all these treaties were constructed according to the precedence of international law as the British saw them, because that was important from the British point of view. And then they were um, then signed by those empowered to act for their countries, the governor, the superintendent of Indian affairs, various generals or naval officers. But the proceedings also adhered to native traditions as well, including the ceremonies that called on spiritual power to consecrate the alliance or agreement, songs and dances, rattling gourds, that sorts of thing, which are described by the British in wonderful details. The Americans stop, you know, uh, taking these kind of long uh, discussions of what the proceedings are, but the British really do a good job. Uh, there was ritual gift exchange. The Creeks awarded honorific titles. So did the British, gave people medals. There was smoking of peace pipes. And the Creek diplomats were certainly capable of bartering and negotiating, and they refused to budge at times, particularly uh, in, in a couple of notable occasions. Uh, one in regard to we want better trade prices and uh, on several occasions on land they simply refused to give up land uh, or as much as the British wanted on some occasions and once you got a boundary uh, delegations of headmen and surveyors would go out clear the land you know cut down trees uh, mark them with blazes or um, and a lot of rivers were used as boundaries too and so you have these wonderful, you know, this, these wonderful images from this Congress in 1765, which shows the, the British. Um, here are the Creek delegates, some smoking the peace pipe. Uh, I've got a blow up of this one. Let's see if the... 
Well, can you see my little pointer up here? Um, by the way, for all of you who are, uh, where do you go? I think that's William Bartram, by the way. He was at this Congress. If you know uh, William Bartram, got to be him in that Quaker hat. Um, here they are. This is probably uh, the headman, uh, the he uh, uh, one of the Lower Creek towns, and this is either Governor James Grant of East Florida or John Stewart. And I love these women who accompanied, and I especially like what they're wearing. And uh, what they're wearing are uh, presents of clothing for women. These are strings of beads. But these little things, notice the cinch waist, they're wearing whalebone corsets. Yeah. I mean, so this is a very uh, big and important occasion uh, attended by dozens and sometimes uh, hundreds of Indians. Um, I think I've already said that in 1771, the British tried to readjust their 1765 boundary and the Creeks said, we'll give you a little bit, but not nearly what you want because we intend to settle that region for ourselves as soon as we finish this war with the Choctaw we've got going. And they did that. And that became the core of the Creek settlement around the Tinsaw, which becomes very important later on. They said, it's our land, we're gonna settle it. And it becomes very important in Creek and American history. So by 1773, you have a very well-defined Creek nation based on these border um, congresses. Um, and 1773 is uh, in particularly another Congress that's uh, very important. It was a highly irregular and precedent-setting Congress, and that is the Georgia New Purchase, in which two parcels of land, one up here and one down here, were sold, hence it's called the New Purchase, to Georgia in return for the cancellation of the entire national debt of the Creek Nation, as well as other goods. Now, this little deal had been started by the Cherokees to get rid of their national debt. The Cherokees also had to cede territory, but this was a very complex um, treaty. It went against British law. The governor of Georgia had to get special permission to carry it through, and it was highly unpopular and it was the first to commodify Creek land. The Creeks are in debt to their traders. They really didn't have a, a, a real choice because they were told, if you don't pay your debts so we can settle our debts, we're going to fold and nobody's gonna bring you guns and goods. And you have discussions in which headmen are saying, we don't like it, but what can we do? We don't make weapons. And so they gave up this land, but they didn't give up all Georgia wanted, but they did sell the land. And it won't be the first time. It will keep going when creeks have to part with land um, to pay debts. So the American Revolution uh, comes, you know, in the immediate aftermath of this treaty. And it is another watershed event for the Creek Nation. And at war's end, the new state of Georgia forced several land sessions on the lower creeks who did not get consent or approval from the lower towns. And this is important because in all those other boundary negotiations, for instance, at Piccolotta in East Florida, Piccolotta, by the way, is near St. Augustine, the lower creeks make the decision on what land they're going to live, uh, give. And then the upper creek towns say, if they want to give it, it's fine with us, we approve. At Pensacola, when they negotiated the West Florida boundary, the upper creek headman um, say, yeah, this is what we're going to give. And the Lower Creek headman who's there said, this is their their land. They know more about it. We, you know, we'll, we'll go along with whatever they decide. So this was kind of the shaky agreement among the Creek towns. But um, the lower, several Lower Creek headmen who did not get the consent of some of the lower upper towns uh, did sign over considerable quantities of land as the price of peace. Um, since some creeks, mainly upper creeks, had assisted the British during the war. And the Georgians said, you fought against us, you are our enemies, you have to give us this land if you want to resume trade and that sort of thing. Um, and along with this uh, came that dramatic uh, demographic shift I was talking about, because by 1800, just after the revolution, the population of Georgia was over 160,000 people. The creek population at the time based on towns along the Chattahoochee, Flint, and rivers in Alabama was 25,000. 
So you have 25, let's even be generous and say maybe 30,000 creeks who are claiming basically Florida, most of Georgia and Alabama with, without the kind of military and economic presence you, you need to defend that, that boundary. Um, so, and the old deer skin co economy was dead. It was no longer a profitable enterprise. Georgians uh, wanted land, they wanted to farm. The creeks are still economically dependent on others for manufactured goods and weapons. And so they are, you know, the balance of power has shifted with the American Revolution. And here's another shift, the adoption of the Constitution, because it ushered in a new Indian policy, which one historian has called expansion with honor. Now, under this uh, new constitutional government, it was the federal government, not the states, who would have a government to government relationship with Indian tribes and they were to be regarded as sovereign, independent nations. In other words, this isn't like this, you know, Alabama or Georgia, they don't make treaties with the federal government, right? Indian tribes do because they're sovereign, independent nations. Now the feds uh, would, like the old British empire, handle all aspects of Indian relations. I can't tell you how much this annoyed Georgia, right? Because they they have they want to you know press things in a different way, uh, and and that means the federal government uh, handles the purchase of land for national expansion by treaty negotiations. This sets the precedent, and the land acquired if the if the if it was from the creeks, uh, it would then be given over to Georgia because Georgia had massive land claims. All right what, all the way to the Mississippi or the Pacific at this time, they have uh, expansive claims that basically is Indian territory. Um, and that was the same for other tribes and all the other states who had claims to the mountains, to the Mississippi, to the Pacific. So the federal government takes the lead. And wouldn't you know, it's the Creeks who are in the middle of everything again with the firstest and the mostest, because the first treaty under the Constitution was the Treaty of New York 1790 with the Creek Nation. And the Creeks were happy to have it because the federal government, um, they had to give up the territory they'd already lost under those earlier treaties, but the United States promised to uphold Creek sovereignty. Um, the United States promised that if the boundary was violated, the United States would back the Creeks. The government, in effect, says we will, you know, we will help defend you against encroachment by states. Uh, that's going to be a hard promise to keep and a troublesome one as well. Uh, but this treaty, uh, with all its uh, uh, ifs, ands, and buts, uh, did set a precedent for the way all tribal treaties were handled by the United States. And the negotiations involved the same mixture of Western legal tradition, written treaties, international law, that sort of thing, and native ceremony. And I've written an article about the Treaty of New York uh, for Alabama Heritage and, you know, George Washington and the first federal Congress, they, they embraced these ceremonies. Uh, and it was a spectacular thing in New York, which, by the way, was serving as the national capital. And one of the last things that happened in New York before the uh, the, the nation's capital was temporarily moved to Philadelphia, was this treaty. So this was a big deal and a big coup for George Washington, who had settled the Indian problem in the Southeast and also established another uh, very important uh, policy of his government, civilization through education and assistance. In other words, if you are going to act honorably as a new nation, you can't just go in and wipe out, oops, wipe out these Indian tribes. You have to negotiate with them. You assimilate them. So it turns out to be a very problematic um, policy, but it is a very important component of this treaty. And the Creeks were the poster children for that because they were viewed as being already quite civilized, having uh, by that time uh, the beginnings of plantations and the slave economy. Uh, they were already uh, had cattle herds and things like that. So they were they were going to be the government's uh, poster uh, uh, child for the fact that you could assimilate the Indians into the national uh, fabric. And note this same uh, mixture of leading towns 
journeyed all the way to New York. And I know it's hard to read, but you got four Coweta chiefs, some Casita chiefs. They speak for the Lower Creek towns. You've got the chiefs from Little Tallahassee. You've got the, the Casadas. Those are the Alabamas. My little green dot keeps going out. You've got the Natchez who are beginning to get on the rise here. They're an interesting component. And the Tuckabanchee and Tallahassee chiefs. So you've got them from all components uh, of the, 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 the regional components of the Creek Nation there. Um, and uh, more treaties with the United States are going to follow. And increasingly, they're about land. The United States, Georgia in particular, wants more land. But also the right to travel through the Creek Nation. And this is in particularly important after the Louisiana Purchase because the fastest way between Georgia and New Orleans is right through the heart of the Creek Nation. And so the, the United States wants the right to build roads through the Creek Nation, to travel on Creek Rivers, which is, by the way, a violation of sovereignty if you force that down somebody's throat who doesn't want you going through their nation. Um, there are demands for the National Council to hand over those who committed crimes, robberies and murders. Uh, and this is a key point because to uphold treaties, the National Council were bound to punish criminal activity by outsiders. And when groups of Greeks um, angered over various things, start robbing riders on the post road or beating them or murdering them or do home invasions against settlers in Tennessee who were on Creek lands, then that is viewed as an act of war by the Americans and the National Council is under tremendous pressure. You got to execute these people, or we're going to march in, and we're going to take we're going to take things in hand. Is basically what the Americans said. And so the National Council to uphold treaties, um, remember that render justice thing. Uh, they send in in 1813 warriors of the nation. They have dubbed as lawmenders. Uh, the light light horse would be what they're called today to punish any Creek warriors who had robbed or murdered Americans. And at that point, many Creek people felt that the National Council had overstepped their mark because traditionally it was the clans who quietly handled these kind of matters. And so we all know the outcome of this tangled mess, and that was a bitter civil war among the Creek people. Now, the last treaty I'm going to touch on is the one of August 9, 1814, the Treaty of Fort Jackson. It also acquired a whopping big land transfer, over 21 million acres. And this was cast by the Americans as necessary to pay for the expense of fighting a war against the, in, the Red Stick insurgency on behalf of the National Council. And unfortunately, the National Council had said, we need help from our allies to put down this. You come and we'll pay the cost. They just didn't check the price tag uh, before the war. Uh, the point I want to make, uh, aside from that, you know, other issues, um, is that like previous treaties, the leading men from the leading towns of the major components of the Creek Nation came to negotiate. A lot of people uh, have asked me, how did those guys have legitimacy to do that treaty? It was a war against the Red Sticks. Well, they're the national government. And again, here you see uh, that you have two Tallapoosa towns, two Alabama towns, some Abeka towns, and the Lower Creeks. They all send representatives and negotiate. No red sticks there, but the uh, these are these are men who had been allies of the Americans, and, and they you know I don't think we should be too hard on these guys. They did not have a strong position to say the least. The Creek Nation was divided. Virtually, if not every town in the Upper Creek Nation was destroyed. Uh, the Creeks had suffered incredible population loss through the war. There had been no crops planted in 1814. People were starving. They had no military presence to speak of, except as allies of the United States, supplied by the United States. Uh, and the U.S. had established military posts all through the Creek Nation. And not only that, they had armed and engaged Cherokee and Choctaws to help them fight Creek people. So there's no real choice but to go wrong with what Andrew Jackson demanded, which the other American commissioners, you know, were kind of horrified by. But the Creek diplomats, to their credit, did contain the damage to a very limited extent because the original session was much bigger. It would have included the, uh, the town of Tuckabatchee. So they got a little bit of a pushback. They also managed to get compensation for those Creeks who had not been fighting against the United States, who lost land. Uh, in this territory that was ceded to the United States. And that becomes the basis for Porch Creek land claims uh, as well. So that's very important. 
So uh, I have been about as broad and general as you can be on such a large topic over a short time, but I hope you will have at least three takeaways. And the first is there were numerous treaties <laughs> in the 18th and 19th centuries between the Greeks and the British and later Americans, and of course the French and Spanish, I didn't even talk about those, most involved land, uh, but other important issues as well, uh, including trade agreements, reciprocal justice, a variety of things. Mostly these were negotiated uh, agreements. That's my second point. Uh, and the Creeks start from a position of relative power, uh, when it begins by the early 19th century, they have fewer options, they have weaker positions due to demographic, economic, and military superiority by the Americans in the 19th century. And especially, number three point, that the treaty making process contributed to institution building among the Creeks. The headmen appointed to deal with outsiders in the late 17th century um, uh, the, you, what you have is the evolution from a collections of headmen to an established and recognized national council to speak for the nation on issues of trade, land sessions, foreign relations, and other necessary matters. Uh, it also uh, saw the rise or the existence of a marked, legally recognized under international law boundary territory in which the Creeks were to exercise sovereignty, a Creek nation. So that's one thing you get from the treaties, even though the Creek nation uh, keeps shrinking. And I think if we view the treaty making process as negotiation and understand the larger forces around which the Creeks negotiated, we can restore agency and power and understanding to the Creek side of the story. Because I think Creek diplomats dealt with increasingly complex issues at the same time, their nation's power and influence dwindled. And overall, I think we should probably have admiration uh, that they managed not only to do what they did, but to preserve their nation through war and through these, these terrible times that they faced in the 19th century. Thank you. Um, so for our next speaker, uh, I wanna invite up uh, Dr. Haberman. Um, he is the author of, of two books, um, and you can see in the, in the brochure here a little about him, um, but he is the leading scholar on Muscogee Creek removal. Um, I know in all of my research, I greatly depended on, on his work. Um, so it's kind of a treat to have him here. So welcome, Dr. Haverman. All right, thank you for having me. Uh, Catherine prefaced her talk by saying that uh, not all treaties are coerced and that, you know, creeks are negotiating from an area, uh, a period of uh, strength. And I'm here to talk about all the coerced treaties and the creeks negotiating from a, a position of incredible weakness. Um, and so uh, a lot of times, you know, recently a lot of uh, books and, and articles have been written about removal. But, you know, in the 1990s, when I'm going to high school and college, very little is written in the textbooks about removal. And what is kind of mentions usually just a paragraph, and it kind of just alludes to, you know, Andrew Jackson's president, and he sends in the army and rounds them up, and they they get forced west. And, you know, that that's like a little uh, part of removal, but uh, removal occurs through treaties. All right. And so let's real quickly just back up. And when I talk about the Creeks, uh, I'm really talking about, you know, the, the Creeks experience is not unique. Uh, this is happening with the Chickasaws and the Choctaws. It's happening with the Menominees and the Potawatomis up in the northern states as well. Uh, and the government sort of it, they have a plan on how they're going to remove the Indians. Um, and I should also mention the Indians don't want to cede their land and move west. And so a lot of the treaties and the things that happened beginning in the 18 teens uh, through the 1840s, a lot of it is sneaky and underhanded on the part of the federal government. All right. So let's just step back really quickly. Uh, the government's official policy toward the Indians begins to switch after the end of the War of 1812. They start to move away from the civilization program and toward the wholesale removal of the eastern Indians across the Mississippi River. Uh, they send commissioners all over the eastern United States to try to get the, the Indians to cede land. Uh, now, of course, most Indians do not want to cede their land, and so they kind of come up empty. And so the government resorts to a lot of sort of underhanded strategies. Um, coercion is one, uh, cajoling, bullying, threatening. Andrew Jackson goes down to Mississippi and bullies and threatens the Indians in the 18-teens uh, on a number of occasions. 
Uh, but one of the uh, most effective strategies is to find a particular Indian who is willing to sell land uh, for a bribe. Uh, and, you know, a lot of Indian nations have their own uh, people who do this. But for the Creeks, uh, this gentleman is William McIntosh. And William McIntosh is somewhat of a fringe character until kind of the, the first Seminole War when he goes and fights alongside the United States and he gets a commission in the U.S. Army. And uh, it's around this time that he cedes the first strip of land in Georgia to the federal government. And he does this for a bribe. And this is so distracting and, and, and worrying to the Creek headmen that they pass a law soon thereafter that makes selling uh, land uh, by an individual without the approval of the National Council, the Creek National Council, and as Catherine mentioned, this is a body made up of all the pre uh, preeminent chiefs uh, from every town, uh, that anybody who cedes land without the approval of the National Council uh, will be executed. All right, so this is very, very serious stuff. Now, William McIntosh uh, is fairly brazen because a couple of years after this law was signed, was uh, signed, uh, he cedes land, cedes more land. And this is the 1821 Treaty of Indian Springs, which I don't really have up here. This is sort of pre-removal. And this cedes another uh, chunk of land in Georgia. And William McIntosh does not get executed here. He um, goes into overdrive. Uh, we think he provides enough presents and bribes to the headman that he sort of escapes uh, execution on this. Uh, but William McIntosh is not done, and the federal government is not done with William McIntosh, because three years after the Treaty of Indian Springs, uh, commissioners come down to negotiate another session of land. Uh, and so negotiations for the 1825 Treaty of Indian Springs begins in uh, 18, late 1824. Um, and it happens in secret. Uh, even the, the prominent chiefs don't know exactly what's going on. William McIntosh and the commissioners sometimes negotiate in the woods in the middle of the night. William McIntosh is very aware of what happens if he signs this treaty, and yet he went forward with it anyway. Uh, in February 1825, uh, the negotiations are done. The land has been established, what he wants to sell to the federal government. And he calls a meeting of all the chiefs to his plantation at Indian Springs in Georgia. Uh, the chiefs know what's going to happen, but they don't quite know the extent of what's going to happen. And it's there that the treaty is presented, and it's a massive amount of land. It's more or less all of their land in Georgia and a large chunk of land in Alabama. And really, William McIntosh, who is, uh, you know, by 1825, he's a very prominent headman. He's the fifth ranking member of the National Council. So um, he's very, you know, he's got a lot of power. Um, he's got a lot of followers. Uh, he's a Lower Creek headman. Um, he's selling all of the Lower Creek land in Georgia, but he's also selling a large tract of Upper Creek land in Alabama as well. So he doesn't have permission to sign to sell Lower Creek land in Georgia by himself without the approval of the National Council. He certainly does not have the approval to sell Upper Creek land in Alabama. Uh, and so when the Creeks, uh, the chiefs see this, you can imagine just, I mean, if you were a fly on the wall at this, at this meeting, just the, the buzz going on with this. And right before the signing happened, uh, Apothula Holo, who is uh, arguably the most powerful headman in the entire Creek Nation, stands up and tells William McIntosh, I warn you, you're about to cede our country. I now warn you of your danger. And so he's directly telling William McIntosh about the fact that he's his life is on the line if he signs this. Sure enough, he signs and he, they all walk off. William McIntosh and the commissioner signed this treaty. Um, there's 50 signers of this treaty. William McIntosh is the only one that appears uh, as a chief of any note. And there's a list of all these chiefs, and a lot of them are, you know, we don't know who this guy is. Uh, we don't know who that guy is. This is a low-level chief, et cetera, et cetera. They're all his family members, business partners, cronies, hangers-on, et cetera, et cetera. There's not one person who signed the Treaty of Indian Springs that had any sort of power within the Creek Nation, except for William McIntosh. Um, and so the treaty is signed, and the Treaty of Indian Springs is not a unique treaty. It's absolutely a standard type of treaty that the federal government would have presented to different Indian nations, all right? And what the Treaty of Indian Springs does is it cedes all the, you know, whatever the, the scope of the eastern land was, I'm just speaking in generalities now, uh, and it traded it acre for acre for land in what is now Oklahoma. Uh, 
And so the way the commissioners presented this treaty to the Creeks is by saying, you're not losing any land. We're just taking your land in the East and we're transferring it to the West. So don't think of yourself as losing land. Think of it as moving land. You're just moving to a different area. And of course, they'll say all the benefits that come with moving. Whites are encroaching on you. They're moving westward, westward through Georgia. You'll never have to deal with white people ever again. Uh, Oklahoma is a land of bounty. It's so much more beautiful and more bountiful than your land in Georgia and Alabama. You'd be a fool not to move there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The Creeks are not fools. And of course, they realize we don't want to move there. In fact, actually, a real ironic thing about it, William McIntosh's half-brother, who is a signer, of the Treaty of Indian Springs, and who, in fact, will assume his brother's position as the head of this new Western Creek government, is asked on sort of the eve of the signing what he feels about the Indian Territory land. And he says, I don't really like it. We went hunting out there. We used to go hunting out there every year, and the mosquitoes and flies are so big, they're so annoying, and eh, it's not so great. But, of course, he's going along with his brother, and he's kind of going along with, with these other people. Uh, and so, you know, the, the Macintosh party is not unified in how they feel about moving west. Uh, you know, why they do it, we don't really necessarily even know. Some of it is for money, we think, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, some of it is just because I think they're going along with William Macintosh. He does have sort of a cult of personality. There's a lot of, we, we do see some letters talking about he's our head and we're just the arms and legs, meaning he's he's our guy. We're following him regardless. Um but another aspect of the Treaty of Indian Springs is that has a, it has an immigration component to it, all right? So the idea of transferring land to the West, right, the government is now also going to say, look, we're going to pay for your transportation, okay? We will pay for everything. All you have to do is meet at a certain time. We'll put your stuff in a wagon, and the federal agents, military personnel, whoever, will lead your group to Indian territory. And on top of it, because you're going to get there and it's going to be maybe late in the season, you won't be able to plant we will um, give you a year's worth of food. So you can clear land, you can plant crops, don't worry about the first year, we'll give you food. We're gonna make it as easy as possible for you to move to Indian territory, okay? Um, and so this is a kind of a standard type of treaty. The other type of standard treaty would have a, would be a land session, but would not have the immigration component because you know maybe they don't agree to immigration. They a lot of Indians said, okay, finally you bullied us into ceding land, but we're not going to move to Indian territory. This is the last acre of land you're ever going to take from us. You can have this section, but we're never moving again. And the commissioners couldn't get that immigration part uh, inserted. All right. Either way, the Treaty of Indian Springs or the other treaties that are signed by other Indian nations that don't have an immigration component, the, they're going to ultimately lead to removal because what the Treaty of Indian Springs does and what these other treaty land sessions do is they make the, the, the domain of these Indian nations so small that it's untenable. Uh, it's going to give up millions of acres of hunting land. It's going to force Indians from the ceded territory onto a smaller portion. And most Indians already had their homes and they had, they were, you know, by the 1820s, they're not settled in the villages as much anymore as they're settled. They're, they're spread out quite a bit because they're, they have livestock and they have their own agricultural fields. And, you know, Alabama is kind of spotty when it comes to fertility. So they're, you know, they're, they're finding the best pieces of land and they're finding the best grazing land. So they're all diffused. Uh, and so uh, they're going to lose this. And so, you know, when they come, when these Indians from, you know, let's just say Georgia after the Treaty of Indian Springs come into Alabama, they have a really tough time finding arable land. All the good land has been taken already. And so starvation sets in, et cetera. And that's what the government wants. They know by taking all these millions of acres of land, life going forward for the Indians are going to be very, very hard. And it's just a matter of time before they're going to come to the federal government asking for assistance. Then if we have that immigration component, we're going to say, just move west. If they don't, have, if they've signed a treaty that doesn't have the immigration component, then we're going to say, hey, let's sign another treaty and we'll pay for your move west. All right. So that's kind of how these things work. All right. Uh, and again, the Indian Springs, it happens all over the eastern United States and the northern states as well. All right. Um, Immediately after the Indian Spring signing, uh, the chiefs who are opposed to ceding land and moving go into overdrive, and they launch one of the most effective campaigns to get this treaty overturned. They send delegates to Washington, D.C. They, you know, do anything they possibly can 
to get this thing overturned. Um, William McIntosh uh, will be executed on April 30th, 1825. So if it, this is not a rash act. The Creeks deliberated for a few months before uh, assigning the death warrant on William McIntosh. His death uh, has been written about. There's a lot of primary sources on it. All of them have a smidge of a different uh, take on it. So we, we're not sure 100% what happened. But the best one is that in the middle of the night, pitch black, uh, a bunch of 200 up to 250 warriors under Menowa appear at William McIntosh's Chattahoochee River Plantation. And, um, you know, he might, may not, depending on what you read, gotten a couple shots off from the second story window. And just almost like a John Wayne movie, he somehow appears uh, in the front door on his piazza, his patio, in front of 200 people who would immediately shoot him. It's like a gangster movie, uh, et cetera. You could, Hollywood couldn't have scripted anything that uh, that nice, except for the fact, I'm not sure why he did it, because his son, Chili, was in the house and was smart enough to escape out a back window dressed as a white man he dressed as a businessman and he fled into georgia so if william mackin i don't know if william mackintosh just said this is it and he's never going to be left alone or what uh, but he uh you know he was shot right on the front porch of his house they dragged him by the heels in one account to the edge of his property and they then uh shot his corpse up to 100 times with bullets so this was a rage killing this was not simply an execution there was a lot of anger behind this um so William McIntosh is dead. So the question then becomes is why on earth did William McIntosh sign this treaty when he, you know, he had been warned several times that he was going to die? Uh, and I, the answer to that is, I don't know. Again, I do not know why he would appear uh, in his front porch facing 250 warriors, you know, thinking that he ever had a shot of surviving that. Um why did they pick April 30th? Well, I just found new research that says that that was the day William McIntosh was going to leave to go to Indian Territory to survey his new land. So they found that wasn't a, apparently April 30th, 1825 is not a coincidence. They wanted to kill him before he left for Indian Territory. Um, I have a few. I know why William McIntosh ceded the land. I'm fairly certain. It wasn't about money, although money was nice. William McIntosh was wealthier than any white person that lived in the region. He had uh, two plantations. He had a tavern. He had thousands ahead of cattle and horses. He had uh, African-American slaves. Uh, he just he was wealthier than anybody in the region. And he was going to give that up by having to move west and restart. He was going to have to replant. He was going to have to do all this stuff. It was, a, you know, he would, certainly would have rebuilt his empire west of the Mississippi River. But man, what a hassle it would have been. He could have just said, I'm buying here and making a lot of money. I think this was a coup. William McIntosh was the fifth ranking member of the National Council. And um, that I don't think was enough for him. And he knew that if he went to what is now Oklahoma, he would have established and been the uh, principal chief of the Western Creeks. Any chief that went after him, even those more powerful than, than him in the East, would have been subservient to him. And so I think he was going to, he was angling to become the principal headman of this new Creek nation in the West. And he probably saw it on the wall, the writing on the wall, removal is going to happen. Whites are never going to stop taking our land. And I might as well be the head guy in the West. And the best, you know, evidence I have for this is that this is what happened with Rowley. Rowley is his half brother. Rowley is the guy that assumes uh, William McIntosh's position as the head of this McIntosh party, this kind of ragtag group of, you know, hangers on and family members. And when Rowley moves to the West, he becomes the principal chief of the Western Creeks. And in fact, he holds on to that position into the 1850s. And even the head chiefs like Menowa and Jim Boy and Apophila Holo, all these famous headmen in the East, they're subservient to him. He is the principal guy. Uh, they're still powerful in the West, the Pafio Holo is, but they're not as powerful as William Mac, uh, as uh, Rowley McIntosh is. So Rowley McIntosh becomes the head of this new Creek government. Okay. And I think William McIntosh was angling for that. All right. Um, real quickly with the execution. Of, now, and I will say this about William McIntosh. He probably put little too much faith in the federal government to do its job because there was an article in the Treaty of Indian Springs that promised, guaranteed, if you will, protection to William McIntosh. 
and his followers if they sign this. And of course, I've never seen the federal government, um, you know, mess anything up. So it's surprising that this happened in 1825. Uh, but they didn't provide protection to him. And, uh, and so this, of course, uh, is a big problem. The Creeks that execute William McIntosh, they just basically kind of go down the list and they start executing. They they'll only get to a couple. There's only, I think, two others that get executed. Um, some are not executed because they uh, they flee into Georgia under the protection of white military personnel. Uh, some are unable, some are actually chasing uh, another guy, but the Chattahoochee River is flooded at the time and they can't cross very easily, so they, they he escapes. Um, politicians in Georgia and uh, in, in Alabama try to kind of calm things down because they're afraid that there's going to be another Indian War. Um, Interestingly enough, the Treaty of Indian Springs is negotiated under James Monroe's administration, but now J John Quincy Adams becomes president and he sort of inherits this mess. And he, Indians, not necessarily big on his, you know, first hundred days list. So now he's got to put out these fires in, uh, in Alabama, in Georgia. Um, he sends commissioners down with basically the, the, the goal of just make these Indians, uh, agree to the Treaty of Indian Springs. Just tell them, look, we're sorry that this fringe character signed this treaty illegally. You have to abide by it. We're going to now back the McIntosh faction. So two agents go down. And so you have Creeks in Washington, D.C., lobbying Congress, lobbying the president, et cetera, that this treaty is fraudulent. It wasn't signed by the National Council. William McIntosh doesn't have any real power. And the 49 others who sign it have zero power. Um, there's also a campaign of uh, to lobby these two agents, telling them how fraudulent this thing was. Um, and so uh, the agents go down basically saying, okay, we're just going to ignore the, the Creeks and we're going to kind of side with the McIntosh faction. But the Creeks are so persuasive in councils that the agents begin writing letters back saying 49 fiftieths of the Creek nation say, disavow this treaty. It's fraudulent. It's not. And so they be, they now turn around and begin saying, we got to do something about this. Now, there's a little sub uh, story, a uh, parenthetical going on with Georgia. You have a, a very um, uh, grouchy governor and, and troop who is convinced that uh, if the Treaty of Indian Springs is ripped up, he will start a civil war. And so he does talk about Georgia going to war with the federal government. Uh, and Georgia, I think mean, Catherine mentioned Georgia is very aggressive when it comes to the to the Creek Indians. They get as aggressive or more in the 1820s, and they're threatening war. They're they're you have no idea how uh, the two commissioners that come down, uh, Andrews and Gaines, just can't stand George Troop. They cannot. They just think this is the, he's just the biggest bully on the block, and they can't. They don't even want to listen to this guy. Uh, and he's threatening to survey the land before the time is allotted for the Creeks to leave. Blah 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 blah. It's just a mess. And John Quincy Adams has to figure out what to do. Um, that said, despite threats from Georgia, the Creeks are so persuasive in convincing the federal officials that this treaty was fraudulently negotiated and fraudulently signed that they agree to rip it up. And in January of 1826, the Treaty of Washington is signed. This is the very only treaty in American history that has been signed, that has nullified another treaty, another Indian treaty, after it was approved by the Senate and confirmed by the president. This treaty was essentially law. The Treaty of Indian Springs was essentially law. The Senate approved it, and it was signed into law and um, by John Quincy Adams. And it was ripped up. It was it was nullified. The 18, you know, no treat, no Indian treaty before or after has ever been nullified that has gone on to become law. And so the 1826 Treaty of Washington, uh, I combine these two treaties, they're essentially the same thing. Uh, Georgia is not gonna give up on their threats to start a war. And so I think the Adams administration, uh, the yeah, the Adams administration realizes that they have no recourse. They're gonna have, they're gonna basically tell the Creeks, you're gonna have to just give up Georgia. There's just no way we can do that, but we'll give you your Alabama land back. And so that's essentially what the 1826 Treaty of Washington does. The Georgia land stays with Georgia and the federal government, but the Creeks will get their Alabama land back, okay? The problem with the 1826 Treaty of Washington is that all the worst elements of the Treaty of Indian Springs pass into the 1826 Treaty of Washington. It's great that they got their Alabama land back, but they lose their hunting land in Georgia, which is extensive still. 
but that immigration component is still there. And so the federal government is still enticing any Creek Indian who wants to move to Indian territory. They're, they say, we're going to make it as easy as possible for you to go. We're going to pay your way. We're going to, you don't have to do anything. Just show up. We'll get you there. And by the way, we'll give you a year's worth of food while you get your crops up and running. Okay. So this is going to be a problem. So really the 1826 Treaty of Washington is just a revised Treaty of Indian Springs. And in my book, uh, Shameless Plug, I got a few copies back there. I talk about them as sort of one thing. I'll mention them as the 18, 1825 Indian Springs slash 1826 Treaty of Washington, because aside from the Jordan, aside from the Alabama land coming back to the Creek Nation, they're exactly the same thing, almost verbatim word for word. Okay. Um, the Treaty of Indian Springs slash Treaty of Washington do exactly what they were designed to do. They make life in the remaining 5 million acres of the Creek Nation untenable, okay? All the Georgia land's gone. So all so if you could kind of imagine, um, within a year or two after the Treaty of uh, Washington is signed, Columbus, Georgia, which we're all familiar with, gets platted. Uh, that's going to be a jumping off point into the Creek Nation. So before the Treaty of Indian Springs slash Treaty of Washington, the closest Creek, you had a couple of towns like Forsyth and Milledgeville and whatnot that are 60, 70 miles away. And in the 1820s and teens, travel is actually really difficult. It's hard and dangerous. And very few white people would make that long, arduous 60 to 70 mile journey from kind of East Central Georgia into the Creek Nation because it, was, it took a long time. It was expensive. And quite frankly, even though they're traveling slowly, it was dangerous. There were ravines that you had to cross and, and all these problems. So very few white people relatively few white people made it into the Creek Nation prior to 1825, 26. That's all going to change because Columbus gets platted and it's like a boom town. I mean, it is a boom town. People from the Carolinas, from Georgia, everybody starts to come to Columbus. Uh, it's one of the few Southern states uh, that, uh, or, uh, I should say, it's one of the few frontier uh, cities that Europeans seem to like. There's a number of Europeans that will come here and they say, ah, it's a very pleasant city uh, Columbus was in its earliest days. Um, but you're going to get a lot of shady people who come to Columbus. You're going to get a lot of whiskey peddlers. You're going to get a lot of speculators. People, the goal is to get Creek Indians to buy things on credit because once you have them in debt, you own them. The Creek Indians are very, very honorable people. They absolutely must pay their debts. They have no uh, desire to ever flee from a debt. And so when they say own them, if a Creek Indian feels like they're indebted to somebody, they will pay off that debt. They're that honorable. Uh, and so very quickly, the Creek Indians get uh, bombarded with uh, lines of credit and they use it and they don't quite understand necessarily exactly uh, how it works. And and I mean, they do understand how it works. But again, sometimes in the moment, they don't understand the long term effects of what's going to happen. Uh, you also get squatters, people who use Columbus as sort of a jumping off point to get into the Creek Nation. It's just a short bridge across the Chattahoochee. And Within four years of the Treaty of Washington being signed, four or five years, they did a census of white settlers in the Creek Nation, and they estimated that there were about 25,000 whites in the Creek Nation. There were about 23,000 Creek Indians. So by 1830, 31, 32, there were more white settlers in the Creek Nation than in um, the Creeks in the Creek Nation. All right. Now, of course, the Creeks now uh, getting bombarded with whiskey peddlers, uh, debt squatters taking land again some would just clear a, sorry Catherine did um some would do uh, some would just clear a plot of land that they thought was unoccupied it might be just hunting land or whatnot some would physically go into a house kill the creek indian beat them up or just chase them off and take the house and take the land and whatnot so i mean it's just brazen squatting going on trespassing stealing land all right um the Creeks constantly complained to their agent. They constantly complained to the federal government. And every time they went to Washington, D.C., or they got a letter from, from uh, uh, again, when Jackson takes office in 1829, the, it's always the same thing. If you're having problems, move to Indian Territory. That's And that's, the, that's sort of the insidiousness of the Treaty of Indian Springs and Treaty of Washington is that life, it, the treaty makes life really, really difficult for the people in Alabama. 
And but they have an escape valve. And that's exactly what the federal government keeps pounding into their heads. You must move west. That's your salvation. If you, you know, you move west, there'll be no whites there. All right. Um, and I'll just kind of talk briefly about removal really quick. Um, there are some creeks that do remove, uh, I, you know, uh, move west. Uh, and I call this, you know, quote, voluntary immigration. The first, so in 1825, um, or 27, I should say, November of 1827, the first party leaves. It's made up almost entirely of Macintosh party cronies, business partners, family members, friends, et cetera. There are a number, I, I think I, I kind of traced, I guess, um, people that are from Georgia, the Creek towns in Georgia that lost their land in Georgia. And they're just like, well, there's no land here, so we're going to move. So they weren't necessarily McIntosh followers, but they were ones who suffered from the Treaty of Indian Springs, Treaty of Washington. A year later, another uh, party goes, and I'll show you some routes here uh, in a bit. Um, a year later, um, another McIntosh party goes. Some had such extensive amount of livestock and different plantations here and there that they couldn't quite get everything sold within the time frame that they wanted. So they just said, we'll stay here. And once we sell everything, we'll move West. And that was uh, 1828. 1829 is an interesting thing because in the summer of 1829, a very, very large, the first party was about 600 Creeks and white men married to Creek women. About 450 to 500 made up the second party. But in 1829, 1300 Creek Indians in almost all Creeks, very few white men, uh, left. And none of these, almost none of them had any connection to William McIntosh. So this shows you that the Treaty of Indian Springs and the Treaty of Washington are doing exactly what the federal government designed. Within three years of the Treaty of Washington signing, you have 1300 Creek Indians who are realizing life's getting too hard here. We better move to Indian territory and because otherwise we're going to be, you know, killed by whites, we're going to starve, we're going to whatever. Okay. Um, so that's a big thing. Uh, things are getting, again, as, as the years go on, worse and worse and worse. And I didn't even mention starvation. Um, you're going to have about 7,000 Lower Creek Indians from Georgia who are now moving into Alabama. There's a lot of landlessness. Um, there's a, a British captain who is traveling through uh, the United States in 1828, uh, early 1828. And he witnesses a bunch of Lower Creeks go to the Creek Agency to eat food. The government's giving them kind of essentially welfare to keep them alive. And he said, he has this interesting quote. He, he they're, they're flocking about or something I'm paraphrasing like bees whose hive has been destroyed. All right. This happens routinely. And again, they have no farmland. You know, everything has been more or less uh, claimed by other towns and other individuals, et cetera. And so they're, they're landless, they're homeless, they're, they don't have a means of, of surviving. And so for the next five, six, seven, all up to 10 years, they're on the edge of survival. And uh, and Catherine, would, when I'm writing my dissertation years ago, uh, she was talking about when I use the S word, starvation, she's like, oh, that's a big word. You better make sure that they're actually starving. You're not just, that's not just hyperbole. No, starvation. People, agents are saying Creek Indians are dying of hunger. Uh, uh, Apostle Holo once wrote a letter saying we can't live on air. We can't eat air. He's begging for the federal government to do something. So things are going downhill very, 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 very quickly. They go to Washington, D.C. Uh, a number of times, several times. Every time Andrew Jackson shuts them down, go to West, go West, go West. There's one incident where they're basically held up at the at Brown's uh, Indian Queen Hotel in downtown Washington, D.C. Nobody from Congress will meet with them. The Secretary of War will not meet with them. Jackson won't meet with them. They're just like, oh, they're here again. You could, you can get, you can imagine Jackson saying that to, to uh, one of his uh, his uh, cabinet members, and they just won't meet. So they're just sitting there racking up this huge bill, waiting for somebody to meet with them. In 1832, the federal government uh, deploys another treaty. And this is the 1832 Treaty of Washington, which again is not a unique treaty, but this is sort of a unique treaty for the time. Okay, this is something that kind of was developed in the 1830, late 20s, or early 1830s. They proposed to the Creek Indians that they cede every last square foot of their Eastern land. And in exchange, each family will get a title to 320 acres, which is essentially one mile by a half mile rectangle. All right. 90 of the prominent headmen will get um, 
a 640 acre or a mile by a mile square section of land. Okay. Um, it's not a removal treaty. I've a lot of people who deal in this area sometimes get it wrong. There was there is absolutely no article in it that says anything about immigration or removal or anything. Um, but it is one of the absolute most lopsided, terrible treaties that you could ever ever sign. The Creeks gave up any last bit of power they had and signed this treaty that was so heavily in favor of the government. And the government knew exactly what they're doing. And by the way, as I mentioned, it's not a unique treaty. This, the 1832 Treaty of Washington was modeled exactly after the 1830 Treaty of Dancing Rabbit Creek that the Choctaws had signed uh, two years earlier. Um, so the treaty basically, let's go back. William McIntosh ceded away illegally a bunch of land and he paid with his life, right? He was executed. And that's a warning. And again, pumping 100 bullets into his corpse. Uh, and of course, people know about this, right? The, 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 the horrificness of the, the deaths of these people. The, one of the people that died, uh, Samuel Hawkins, um, or Stephen Hawkins, uh, was uh, made, quote, made to eat fire for three days and three nights. I don't even know what that means, but it sounds awful. Uh, the goriness of these deaths is, is meant as a warning. To, ever, to other people. This is what happens if you ever sell a square inch of our land. Um, and so it kind of got people afraid, I would imagine, right? But now in 1832, things are so dire. There are so many white squatters in Alabama. There are so many uh, whiskey peddlers. The Creeks are in such so much debt. There's so much starvation and death going on that the Creeks from an incredible position of weakness agree to cede every last square inch of their land, come under the jurisdiction of the federal government in Alabama, and each individual Creek family, Creek head of family, Creek man, by the way, which again goes against their matrilineal uh, control of the land. By the way, if you're a white man married to a Creek woman, guess who now has control of that plot of land? We'll talk maybe about that, although I'm running out of time. Uh, a lot of problems with this treaty. Here's another problem. There's about 5 million acres of land um, in what remained of the Creek Nation um, after the Treaty of Washington, the 1826 Treaty of Washington, about 5 million acres of land. Each head of family, you know, they, the 60, about 6,500 heads of families, multiply that by 320 acres plus the 90 chiefs that get 640 acres. It comes to about 2.1 million acres of land. So in other words, 2.9 million acres of land is now going to be empty and it's going to go up for auction so white people can bid on those lands and now settle. So the thing that the Creeks complained about the most, white squatters settling around them, is now legalized, right? Over half of the Creek Nation is now going to be uh, white squatters. And they're not squatters anymore. They're legally purchasing Creek allotments. So that's the number one problem. It's going to legalize white encroachment. Creeks are suddenly surrounded by white people, and they can't do a thing about it. Number two problem is the thing that gave the Creek Nation strength, that they were sovereign, that they controlled this land, and that any Creek Indian who signs away their land will be executed is now out the window. Because each individual family member gets a deed or a title to their land, they're free to sell it as they see fit. And with so much starvation... A lot of creeks sign their land away immediately because they need food. So they'll sign away at land, not just get fair value. They won't get fair value. They'll get whatever somebody's willing to get because they're so hungry. They need land so much or they need food so much. All right. A lot of those creeks who had been indebted to whiskey peddlers and various other people in the years past, they're going to come calling for their debt payment. And so the one thing that the creeks have is a title. So they sell their, they don't sell it. They just say, look, if I give you this land, will you? make it are we even now all right and then there's the frauds um so so again imagine so when you think about the eastern creek nation it doesn't so much you, you know it's not it, it dissolves there it's not one it's 320 the creek nation dissolves in 320 acre increments is kind of how it happens and it breaks up like that um so real quickly, the frauds are, are famous uh, because of just how terrible they were. Uh, white speculators come into the Creek Nation, a lot of them through Columbus, Georgia, 
and they cheat the creeks every conceivable way you can possibly do it um one white agent who's just horrified by this says it, it's just the the types of frauds are as numerous as the ingenuity of man um the most common one is just impersonation we don't have photo id so you're just you know is this your plot of land oh yeah and they you know they look at a plot of land that's really valuable and they find what indian owned it and um, they say i just you find a you, typically you find a, a creek indian who's starving to death and they're willing to to do some shady things and uh, so they'll bribe them in bacon, a lot of times flour, bacon, corn, various other things like that, just to kind of fill their stomach. And they said, all I want you to do is to go up to this certifying agent, federal agents, you know, trying to prevent fraud and say that this is your land. And so he asked them a few basic questions about, oh, where's your square ground located and where's the bend of the, you know, just sort of things to kind of, you know, like little, you know, past code, you have to know what your first car was or your first job on that's kind of what it is they're very basic not anything that you couldn't look up and 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 a creek a person couldn't know already where the where the oak fusky um uh, square ground was etc um and then it signed away and so he may get bribed in corner bacon or maybe for 10 bucks and so this person got a thousand dollar piece of land for ten dollars okay uh, bullying and threats. A lot of times it's the this guy actually owns the land and so you go take him up before a a certifying agent and the certifying agent says, do you want to sell this land for a thousand? He says, yeah, the certifying agent will enter it in his log book. And then the, the guy walks away and the guy threatens to shoot him if he doesn't give uh, the money back. There was one I heard about it. He's basically choking him around the neck. Give me my money back. And so he gives them all, but maybe, you know, five bucks back. So a thousand dollar piece of land you get for five dollars. Uh, some of it is, just, you know, I mean, alcohol plays a large role. People get, you know, intoxicated and they're willing to, to sign whatever you want. Um, uh, I mean, some of it is, it's like, it's almost comical if it wasn't so sad. There was one incident, this happened with a very prominent Tuckabachi chief. He sold his land for four figures. I think it was around a thousand or maybe a little bit more. And uh, after it happened, the guy who participated in the purchase, the white guy wanted to hug him. Yeah. He's like, I don't know why. So they hugged. And while he was, yeah. he I did, uh, reached back and pulled out the money from his, his pouch. Uh, and so he got pickpocketed the money he had had gotten J just awful 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 things uh, and so that's how the creek nation sort of dissolves in the east this this treaty that is is you know the the federal government says is going to save you is going to ultimately be the thing that that destroys them now why on earth then the question is would the creeks agree to such an an awful treaty i mean they it's one thing to say okay we'll we'll take the land but we want all five million acres you know, you're only going to take, you're, you're seeding over half of the land that you have left. Uh, and if people are now free to sell that, which is something that you really made an effort to prevent for the last 10 years. Well, I think, again, it comes down to Creek Indians realizing white people never pay attention or respect the fact that we've been here for eons. We were here first, that therefore we have rights to the land. White people do not accept that. But white people love when something's written down. If you have a contract, they think that that is solid. That's the stone wall, right? So when people buy things, they write that contract and boy, white people really respect the signature. I think the Creeks were saying, okay, you respect a piece of paper that has a name on it. I'll do that. And that way you can never take my land again, because now I have the piece, you know, I've been here before, you know, before you, you don't respect that, but you respect this deed. So give us deeds but it was in such favor of the government that it's going to be their downfall. Um, there's going to be two more emigrating parties that happen after. Um, and I'll just show you this one here. So oh, real quickly, this is, so this is a map I have in my book. Um, and this is, uh, so this is Chambers County uh, and part of Tallapoosa County. And so these are, this each square is the, is one plot of land. So this is a mile by a mile. And the reason I did this is because um, I wanted to trace where those lower creeks from Georgia go after 1825, 26, to show that they're kind of diffused. But um, I don't, what I did not copy is on the next page is a key that tells you what the letters uh, and numbers signify. But the letters signify the different towns. I don't know what C is, probably Casita there or whatnot. And there's two different Casita, there's several Casita branches. So that's why I have different numbers. But the large numbers represent two families that um, each have a section of land because everybody gets 320 acres um, and then from the same town. 
Um, and then, you know, like the ones here, like this is an A and that's a D1. So there, these are two families who split a, a plot of land uh, from two different towns. Uh, and I just did this for just legibility. Uh, and the dark numbers here are Creek uh, chiefs. 90 of the prominent chiefs got uh, a full square mile, okay? That's a whole nother problem because a lot of the, the prominent chiefs that Catherine would know from the Creek War era she might not recognize a lot of the 90 because a lot of it is just, you know, there's a lot of people here are sort of, you know, schmoozing their way with the federal agents to get one, to be one of the 90. There are some prominent headmen who are left off and they're just beside themselves. Uh, and then some in the 1840s actually convinced the government to give them finally a full uh, plot of land. But so this is, this is uh, Chambers and Talapoos. And then uh, here you see Russell County and Macon County, um, and you know all this stuff right there uh different and then i you know um barber county i didn't i have in my book but i didn't i didn't put it there um so just i mean again each family right um white speculators coming in looking at where rivers and creeks are and say oh that's a good piece of land and again when here's another aside but in the 1830s there's massive amounts of land speculation right this is when people are buying up tons of land and possibly railroads and canals are going in and internal improvements. And so white speculators are saying, ooh, you could put a canal between the Coos and the Tallapoosa right here, or the Tom Bigby and this and that. And they just see money in their eyes. So they're saying, ooh, I got to buy up all these land here. Maybe a canal will go in and I'll make them, you know, I'll charge that canal company lots of money for these spots of land. So they're buying up chunks and chunks of land. If you look at the ledger book, there's all, there's not a ton of names it's a lot of the same characters buying up dozens and dozens and dozens of, of, of uh, plots of, of reserves, just tracts of land, hoping to flip it for a profit. Real quickly, I'll just mention something about removal. Ooh, I got to get going because it's a quarter after. But, so removal, I mean, this, I didn't talk about the actual journey west, but again, shameless plug, my book will talk about it. Um, some vol some emigrations are just incredibly easy and it's dry and some it rains all the time it snows um, this one in 1834 um, and I, again this is more a treaty talk than it is a removal talk but people like removal this happened in 1834 they left in the dead of winter they left in December and of course it rains hails or snows basically every step of the way they leave Centerville they go through Mississippi um they some of the it gets so bad they're going to go by land but it gets so bad the 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 free, frozen land they 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 had uh agreed to go west in uh in august in july when it's you know hotter than blue blazes and then of course the government's you know dickering around because they want to wait and get more creeks to come in they, they, only 600 ever left they wanted at least uh, 2000 to go so they didn't leave till december all their winter clothes are packed in wagons and so they're leaving in their summer clothing in December, of course. So they're sometimes going barefoot and whatnot. And it's so cold that all through Mississippi, they have to constantly stop and start fires to get these kids. And they hear about the women and the kids in the wagons crying because it's so cold. They have to, they're like setting up tents as much as they can. They're, they're burning things that they, whatever they can find to get a campfire going. And they do this. I mean, it's just delayed, delayed, delayed. Finally, they get to Memphis. And they 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 uh, hire a steamboat to take the women and children down the Mississippi, and then they go up the Arkansas. But the Arkansas, which is a real fluctuating river, it was kind of low then, and it froze. It froze solid. So they're out here, kind of near Little Rock, and the agent says that they have to tie, um, they have to um, they ram it with the steamboat to try to break it up. They actually get off the steamboat. They cut trees, hoping that the weight crushes the ice. Um, the men who go through, men typically wanted to accompany their horses and their baggage wagons. Uh, they go through the swamp. This whole area right here is just west of Memphis. It's just in an, it's just swamp land as far as you can see. Even now, the Army Corps of Engineers have gone in and just, you know, totally put land there. But if you ever fly into Memphis, you'll just see all these oxbow lakes and swamp land and everything like that. It's just one big bog as far as you can see. This whole area is frozen. They actually, the horse, you know, horses on four legs on the hooves on ice doesn't do so well. They actually tie rope around their legs and drag, they're all splayed out, dragging them across the ice because the horses can't make it. It's one of the worst. And then as they go through Little Rock, 
they go, they knock on houses saying, do you have any food that you, you're willing to sell? Do you have anything? And they notice that every house, the people are down with the flu. And of course, I'm afraid of the flu in 2023, but they were terrified of the flu in 1834. And so the guy that leads this is a captain in the army. He just races them as fast. He says, forget campfires, forget, we're going to get to Oklahoma as fast as we possibly can. So they just race this across Arkansas, hoping to outrun the influenza. Just a disaster. Um, well, anyway, to make a long story short, because I know my time is kind of running up. Um, the Treaty of Washington, the selling of land, the frauds makes just, you have no idea the amount of rage, especially among the young warriors over what's been happening. Whites telling them to emigrate, starvation. Now the whites are coming in and stealing their land reserves. By 1836, these young warriors will, uh, will start a, a, a Creek War, a, the Second Creek War. And they begin indiscriminately going from plantation to plantation, killing whites. And again, it's just some of the, you know, killing families, putting their heads on pikes or various other things like that. A lot of rage, a lot of rage, understandable rage that the Creeks have uh, towards the whites. And then, of course, this gives Andrew Jackson the excuse he was looking for. Aha, you started a war. Now you've lost all rights. And he begins rounding up the perpetrators sending them west on steamboats. But then Lewis Cass, the Secretary of War, Andrew Jackson, the president, said, look, every last Creek Indian has to go, every last Creek. So um, after the first group of prisoners go in chains, he begins sort of rounding up the rest of the Creeks. This isn't forced removal, but it's coerced removal. The Creeks, I think if the headmen had said, we're not going to go, there probably would have been the army sent in to force them to go, much like the Cherokee situation. But you can sense that the headmen have given up because Apocalypse Holo and Tuckabachi Harjo, which I didn't mention, he's really hostile towards the, not hostile is a terrible word. He, he, I would be hostile toward the whites like, like Tuckabachi Harjo would. Tuckabachi Harjo doesn't want to lift a finger to do anything for the federal government. He, he even agreed. He's like, we got to go. I mean, none of them decide to start anything because they realize it's just, it's a, it's a lost cause. They begrudgingly go. And so 1836, with the Creek prisoners in July, and then the, the other 16, 14,000 that go in September, in August and September, makes up the mass uh, of the Creek Nation. And this is the essentially the removal of the Creek Indians. A small group agree to go fight the Seminoles in 1837. Their family members get to fight or get to stay in Alabama through 1837. But again, white people don't like them there, and they kind of hot up. Uh, Accost them, and so they're moved down to Mobile Point, Fort Morgan, and then eventually past Christiane, and they don't get to Fort Gibson until late 1837. And there's a handful of others that remain. Some are in Alabama today, the Porch Creeks, and then others just kind of hide and wait around. Uh, and you have removals in the 18 uh, up through the 1840s. The last kind of official government removal will occur in 1849. And so it's a sad story, but again. The thing that kickstarted it all was the 1825 Treaty of Indian Springs, which just was like a small snowball that just gained steam. And they, the government knew exactly what they were doing when they deployed this. It was by the time 1836 rolled around, it's this unstoppable mass object. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it.